Good evening, church. A Sunday school teacher had concluded her lesson to the little ones and wanted to make sure she had made her point. So she said, can anyone tell me what it is that we have to do before we can have forgiveness of sins? And of course, the little boy in the back says, oh, I know, I know. And she says, what is it? And he said, sin. Now, you may think, well, that's kind of a goofy joke, but it, it, it is exactly uh, tied in with our lesson tonight. We're going to be looking at Luke chapter 7. And we're going to be looking at the sinful woman, Simon the Pharisee, and the story that Jesus tells of the, the two debtors. This is something that we covered in our youth group class uh, last week, and I thought, you know, there's a lot to this story, and uh, I enjoy um, going through this story because uh, it, it's, it's, a vivid, it's a vivid story to me. So I've got to, uh, I'm going to read out of the New King James, and I'm going to read verses 36 through 50, and then we'll have our lesson. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her, hair, hair, with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who was touching him, for she's a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, Teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when he had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one who he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but to, you, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this that even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. Jesus tells a lot of parables in the Gospels. And Luke, thankfully, provides not only this powerful parable, but also he gives us the context of when it was taught. And so we'll look at the scene for a minute. This, this event takes place early in Jesus' ministry when he was still preaching up in Galilee, and he comes to eat at the house of Simon the Pharisee. And don't confuse this with the other... Um, Simon, Simon the leper in Matthew 26 and Mark 14, 3 and John 12. That's another incident of Jesus being anointed, but that occurs um, during Jesus' last week on earth before he's crucified, and it was John in Judea. This event is much earlier in Jesus' ministry. In Galilee, the houses of the poor were very small and usually had one room, but someone like Simon would have more than likely been a little more well off. He would have been in a house that would have had a series of rooms, maybe an opening to an open air courtyard, and there might have even been a garden and a pool. And in warm weather, meals might have even been eaten out in the courtyard. And the furnishings would have been quite different from what you would see if you visited someone's house here in Montgomery. The poor people wouldn't have had a table to eat on. They would lay out a mat and eat on that. Um, the more well-to-do, like Simon, the Pharisee, would use a table, but it was not a tall table like we use. It would have been a very low table. 
and it wouldn't have had any chairs. The people who ate on those tables um, would do it in one of two ways. They either knelt at the table with the feet stretched out behind them, and I got a, a pencil drawing, I guess that is, that kind of shows a little of what I think it would look like. So they would have their feet stretched out behind them, or more usually, they would kind of recline. See the way they are in that picture there? They're kind of reclined on some pillows and a, and a low couch. And they wouldn't have used knives and forks or anything like that. That was an invention that came way later than this time period. They would have used their hands. But again, their feet would be stretched out behind them. And it's noteworthy, too, that rabbis such as Simon would have led a very public life. Even if, walk, even if he's just walking down the road, people would gather around just to talk with him or hear what he had to say. Because people were always discussing religious issues and, and giving situations and things that, that they needed to talk about with the Pharisees. And the Pharisees would, would give their opinions based on what they had been taught. And so even when dining, people would come into their house and they would come in and just kind of watch what was going on and listen to the things that were being said. And here we see that there were people around the wall. And this girl, this woman that we see here, this sinful woman, would have been uh, along the wall area there right at Jesus' feet. And there's nothing surprising to the uh, fact that this sinful woman would have been in a Pharisee's house. Because Pharisees, when they ate, um, it was more or less a public event. People would, people would show up and people who you know, were around would all come in and and it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like our houses today, you know, where, you, you know, you have to ring the doorbell and, you know, wait to be let in. People would just wander in. And so, um, in fact, um, she was one of many. I mean, there was probably a lot of people there. You don't see many in that drawing, but I'm sure there were a lot more people than that. Now we come to the, the, the main character here, Simon. Simon was a Pharisee. And... If you know anything about Pharisees, you know that their name means separate ones. They called themselves the Hasidim, which means the pious ones, but everybody else called them the separate ones, which is Pharisee. They were very, very judgmental toward the common people. They felt themselves much superior to everybody else. We, re we see that uh, specifically in John chapter 7. If you remember when the Pharisees had sent out some people some officers to go arrest Jesus when he was in Jerusalem and the officers came back and uh, said you know they that they didn't have him so in verse uh, cha John chapter 7 verse 45 the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them why have you not brought him and the officer said no man ever spoke like this man and the Pharisees answered them are you also deceived have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him now catch this but this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. So they just considered that these, these people that were following Jesus, this common people that didn't go along with what they were taught, they were all cursed. And these Pharisees were men who spent their entire lives dedicated to keeping every single law that they could possibly keep. They made sure that they did things specifically as they were taught according to the law of Moses and according to the oral tradition that had been passed down. And they looked down on people with contempt who didn't follow and believe everything that they did. And it may seem strange that Simon would even invite Jesus, considering Jesus' reputation among the Jewish leaders to have a meal in a Pharisee's house but you got to consider this happened relatively early in Jesus' uh, ministry, for one. And also, I think there's maybe three reasons possible that Jesus may have been invited. The first one is, I'm sure that Simon the Pharisee had heard, at least heard that Jesus may have been considered a prophet. If so, maybe he was inviting him in to speak with him and so he could maybe debunk those claims. 
And I think Simon may have thought he even had the answer when he saw the woman touching Jesus and thought to himself, nah, this guy were a prophet. Or number two, maybe he was already convinced Jesus was a fraud and he was going to examine everything Jesus said, maybe talk to him so he could bring a charge of blasphemy or something against him. Or maybe Simon was one of these guys that likes to have important people around him, celebrity types, you know, and he just wanted to have Jesus over so he could have bragging rights on the fact that, you know, this, this popular guy that's going around teaching Jesus, I had him at my house, you know. And the fact that Simon gave Jesus none of the usual courtesies of the day would support, I think, any of those three claims because he didn't really treat him like an honored guest. And the woman here, obviously a locally known person, having a bad reputation, I'm sure that all the things that happened here were pretty astounding to the people that were watching. There was something about Jesus that had gone straight to this woman's heart. We don't really know what it was. Maybe she heard that he was a friend of sinners. Maybe some friends had told her what Jesus had taught. Maybe she was there when he had taught earlier somewhere else. Or maybe there was something that Jesus had said during that meal. We don't really know. But no matter the reason, it's obvious that her consciousness of her sins had caused her emotions to just run over. She begins to weep, her tears fall on Jesus' feet. And considering how dusty the roads were, I would imagine you could just see the trails coming down his feet where the dirt was just, just coming off for each tear. And since there's no towel available, she used the only thing she had. She used her hair. Now when you consider the culture during that time and the way a woman's hair was looked at, this is phenomenal. Uh, we know in 1 Corinthians 11:15, Paul says, but if a woman has long hair, it's a glory for her. Her hair is given her for a covering. And also, it was a big social faux pas for a woman to let her hair down in public. In fact, the Jews of that time would have considered any woman who would let down her hair as uh, having the height of immodesty. But she didn't care. It's either she had decided she just didn't care or she just uh, had lost awareness of her surroundings. And women at that time would wear a vial of perfume around their neck on a string or something. Um, and sometimes these vials were very valuable. Balsam, for example, was worth its weight in silver and spikenard is a is a perfume that you hear of sometimes. That was very valuable too. It might have even been the most valuable thing she owned. But she poured it on Jesus' feet. And her love was so intense that even doing that, she just could not stop kissing Jesus' feet. Her worship of Jesus cost her plenty. At the very least, it cost her the perfume, which was a lot of money. But think about the scorn she would have faced from the people there, from the Pharisees, from anybody that would have been aware of what she did. That what she did. But to her, that high price was worth it. Now Simon was undoubtedly taken aback by all this. And he used his detective skills. I like to say, you know, that's what we in the detective business call a clue. Well, that's what he in the detective business thought was a clue when he saw this woman touching Jesus. He jumped at a wrong conclusion about who Jesus was because he was basing his assumption on, on a false premise, namely that he knew another person's heart. The last thing on earth that Simon would have done was let a woman like her with that reputation touch him because he was so afraid of becoming unclean himself. I read that Pharisees like him would have a, a jar of water, a basin of water by their door, that they would wash their hands before they even entered the house because they were so afraid that they might have touched a Gentile, that they would wash before they'd even come in the house. 
But Jesus, however, did know her heart, and he knew Simon's heart too. He knew the heart of the woman that touched him and what kind of woman she was. More than that, he knew what the Pharisee was thinking. So Jesus says, Simon, I have something to say to you. When I hear that, when I see that, the main thing that's in my mind is I would have loved to seen the face of Jesus when he says this. Can you imagine what it would have looked like to him just say, Simon, I got something to say to you. Now, among the Jews, these customs that we talk about would have been a grave discourtesy to someone to omit. Now, they grew out of necessity. You know, they had hot weather. It was dry. It was dusty. Sandals were just leather pieces of leather on the foot held on with a strap. So when a guest arrived, there would usually be someone at the door with a jar of water and a towel, wash their feet and dry them. And then when they went to the table, someone would drop a little scented oil on their head or maybe even light some incense and circle it around their head just to kind of make the person smell a little better. And if a rabbi or a teacher would arrive, it would be the common thing to put the hands on the shoulder and, you know, give them the kiss like they do today in the Middle East, you know, where people would kiss and all that, even though, you know, we don't do that here. And Jesus points out that not one of these acts of conventional courtesy had been offered to him and that the woman in her own way had done all that she could to honor him the way Simon had not. So after gaining Simon's undivided attention, Jesus told the story of the creditor who freely forgave the two debtors. Now note that neither of these two were able to pay their debt. But the creditor graciously canceled both debts. So Jesus asked, which of them will love more? Simon, I think, almost had to have been begrudgingly said, well, I suppose, you know, the one who was forgiven more. And just so, said Jesus, this woman had great sins, and at this point, Simon now knows that Jesus did know about her, and that the forgiveness of them has moved her to great love. And then, to the surprise of everyone, Jesus said her sins were forgiven and told her to go in peace. This wasn't the only time that Jesus had said that. If you go back a couple chapters in Luke, to Luke chapter 5, you see the man who had been lowered down through the roof and Jesus told him to pick up his bed and walk. He also told him that he could forgive sins then. And also I want you to notice the body language of Jesus if you didn't catch it. In verses 44 through 47, all through the, all through the dinner, Jesus is facing Simon while this woman's behind him, washing his feet, anointing his feet. And the whole time he's facing Simon. Then, once Simon's rejection of Jesus is revealed to Jesus, Jesus turns his back on Simon and faces the woman, even though he's still addressing Simon. I think he's by his action here, he's showing his rejection of Simon and his acceptance of the woman. The body language, I think, is, is telling, very telling here. It's an incredible use of nonverbal communication. So, what are we supposed to conclude from all this? Are we to conclude that there's an advantage in having a lot of sins because you'll love more? Does it teach that only one who is forgiven great sins can have a great love for Jesus? Well, the answer is absolutely not. That's not what it's teaching. Jesus here praises a sinner and condemns a religious leader. Why? One word, attitude. Luke, in later on in chapter 18, tells another story where Jesus talks about a Pharisee who stood up and prayed about himself. Luke chapter 18, verses 11 through 13, it says, The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood off at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. 
Jesus pronounces the tax collector justified here and the Pharisee not justified. Jesus, in this story here, now is showing mercy to someone who sees themselves as a sinner and knows it rather than someone who does not see themselves as a sinner. So then, does being aware of our sins make us worthy of God's forgiveness? Well, the answer is no one is worthy of forgiveness. Like the debtor and the creditor in the, in the parable, neither debtor in this parable did anything to have their debts forgiven by this creditor. The forgiveness was free. Likewise, no one today is worthy of forgiveness. Titus 3, verses 4 and 5 reads, When the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Rather, to obtain God's grace, we have to see ourselves as sinners in need of forgiveness. And it's only when we realize what Jesus has done for us that we can really love him and appreciate him as we should. And I think it's interesting that the people who, in the Bible, we see walk closest with God saw their sinfulness as the greatest and realized their own inadequacies. Abraham considered himself but dust and ashes, Genesis 18. God considered Job, right? Uh, upright and perfect, yet Job confessed to God that he was vile, Job 40. Ezra, the scribe, prayed, Oh my God, I am ashamed and blushed to lift up my face, Ezra chapter 9. Peter fell to his knees and begged the Lord in Luke chapter 5, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. And even the apostle Paul, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, calls himself the chief of sinners. So we have to realize our condition. And we have to realize the gift that Jesus gives us. There's a fellow named William Arthur Dunkerley who went by another name, John Oxenham. John Oxenham, he's a poet, who lived from 1850 to 1940. He wrote an imaginative story about what happened to Barabbas after Barabbas was released. After the verdict, his story goes and says that Barabbas follows Jesus. And when he sees the nails being driven into Jesus' hands, his only thought was, these nails should have been driven through my hands, not his. He saved me. And when he saw Jesus finally hanging on the cross, one feeling was in Barabbas' heart, and that was, I should have been hanging there, not him. He saved me. Now, the story about Barabbas is obviously fiction, but here's my point. Shouldn't we feel that same level of responsibility for Jesus' death on the cross? Shouldn't we feel that same responsibility for the nails that went into Jesus' hands? Shouldn't we realize that we should be paying the penalty for our sins, not Jesus? Well, one thing is clear about the death of Jesus. And that is, he suffered all that he did for the sake of all men, as Paul told the Romans in Romans chapter 5, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. And all men means all of us. And I think it's here that we see the root difference between Simon the Pharisee and the woman. The woman knew her condition, and she knew that she needed forgiveness. Simon wasn't conscious that he needed forgiveness for anything. Now we know that from reading Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Simon, we know, had sinned. Don't know what he did, but we know he sinned. And he might have been every bit as sinful as this woman. But the problem was, no matter what his degree of sinfulness, he didn't know it, he didn't acknowledge it, he didn't see any need for forgiveness. So he would never feel the love that she felt. 
And it's true that not all sinners grasp the seriousness of their sinfulness. Today, I think that some of the hardest people to win to Christ are good people as the world sees them, moral people as the world sees them, but they're unsaved. Matthew 7, 21 to 23, Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I'll declare to them, I never knew you depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I think one reason why people will be in this category is because they don't realize their sinfulness. They don't realize their need for forgiveness. And that's sad because Jesus freely forgives those who seek it. And that's the good news in the bottom line, I think, of this parable. Jesus' forgiveness is available to everyone. 1 Timothy 2.6 says, Christ Jesus gave himself a ransom for all. But you have to seek it like the sinful woman did. If you're here tonight and not a Christian, you have to realize your condition. There is a bondage of sin. You may not feel like you're under any bondage, but you are. We know from Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's nobody excluded from that. And because of that, we also read in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin, or what you earn from your sin, is death. But the gift of God, the free gift of God, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So by your sins, and that's everybody, you've earned a spiritual death. But God gave the gift of eternal life through his son. Well, who gets this gift? Well, in Hebrews 5, 9, the Hebrew writer tells us that being made perfect, he, meaning Jesus, of course, became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So how do we do that? Well, first, we have, to believe, we have to believe that Jesus is who he said he was, that he's the son of God. John told us, or Jesus tells us in John 3, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. And we also have to change our lives. We have to stop living for the world and start living for God in obedience and that's called repentance. Peter told the crowd of Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, when they had realized that they had put the Son of God to death, they said, what are we going to do? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in Romans 10.10, 10, Paul tells us that with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, Confession is made unto salvation. So we need to believe in our heart and we need to confess with our mouth that Jesus is the Son of God. And we're then to be baptized or immersed in water for the forgiveness of the sins as Paul explains in the sixth chapter of Roman. Romans. You might think, well, why do I have to be baptized? Here, he says in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 11, do not do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who die, has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that, he, that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to Christ Jesus our Lord. If you're here tonight 
and you realize your sinful condition and realize that God is willing to graciously forgive you of your debt of sin, but you haven't done anything about it, well, tonight's the night to do it. If you're ready to accept God's gift of forgiveness and experience the love that the woman did in this story, and we ask you to please come forward as we stand and sing this song of invitation.